Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. For some people, history is dry and boring. It's all dates and wars and dusty facts about things that don't have anything to do with life today. And yes, that can be true. But history also helps us understand why things are the way they are. Study the past, understand the present, and maybe predict the future, at least to some extent. But history can also be stupid. And when it is stupid, it can be fun to learn about these things. And in addition to all the dates and wars and famous people, I think we need to acknowledge stupid history's stupid bits. Let me give you an example. On July 12th, 1855, S.B. Howe's Star Troop Menagerie and Circus pulled into Toronto. Tents were set up at an area called Fair Green on the shore of Lake Ontario. The plan was to spend two days in town, entertaining crowds with exotic animals, acrobats, trick riders, and clowns. But in 1855, circuses were viewed with suspicion. All these itinerant people living on the margins of society, and often included a lot of drunks and gamblers and sex workers. The threat of violence was always present, and it wasn't uncommon for a night at the circus to be filled with brawls. Now, Toronto was pretty rough back then, especially when it came to brothels. There were a lot of them. One of the most popular was one owned by Mary Ann Armstrong. It was on King Street West. When day one of S.B. Howe's Star Troop Menagerie and Circus concluded, the clowns went to Mary Ann Armstrong's brothel to blow off some steam. And that's when they ran into a bunch of local firefighters. And those firefighters like to get into fights. Details are a bit sketchy, but one of the clowns either knocked off a fireman's hat or a clown cut in line. Whatever the case, a major brawl broke out. Clowns versus firefighters, and the clowns won. The firefighters were forced to pull back. However, July 12, 1855, was also the date of a big parade by the Orange Order, a group of Irish Protestants celebrating a victory over Irish Catholics back in the 1600s. And at the time, a huge majority of Toronto civil servants were Irish and Orangemen. Word spread of the clowns kicking the firemen's asses at the whorehouse. And on the second day of S.B. Howe's Star Troop Menagerie and Circus, a large, angry crowd gathered at Fair Green. It wasn't long before things boiled over. Rocks were thrown. Tents were set on fire. Members of the circus ran for their lives. The police were called, but they were mostly orange men, too. Instead of trying to stop things, the cops just joined in. So we have this insane riot. Clowns versus firefighters and cops. It wasn't until Mayor George Allen stepped in, personally too, when he went down to Fairgreen to administer some whoop-ass himself. And that is how the Great Clown Riot of 1855, as it's become known, came to an end. Totally ridiculous. And this is an example of what I call stupid history. And I believe if they taught this kind of thing in school, more people would have a much greater appreciation in the stories of the past. They would love history. Such information gives us a deeper understanding of just how messed up humans can be, which is part of history. We can do this with music, too. I call this episode Stupid History, the music version. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Those are Canada's arrogant worms showing that they completely understand the assignment of this particular episode. That song is called History is Made by Stupid People. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and like I said, I'm calling this installment Stupid History, the music version. These are some of the dumbest stories from music history that I believe should be taught alongside the serious stuff because it adds color and understanding, and it shows that history's heroes are as dumb and as weird as everyone else. But Alan, you cry, surely you're not only talking about the decadence and silliness of the rock and roll era. Absolutely not. Let me warm you up with this story from the era of great classical musicians. Mozart, 
is widely considered the greatest composer of all time. Symphonies, operas, chamber music, choral compositions. In his 35 years, Mozart wrote more than 800 works that touched on all the Western classical genres. The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, the Jupiter Symphony, the Magic Flute. The list goes on and on and on. It's some of the most beautiful music imaginable. But Mozart was also gross. He also loved to write songs about poop and weird sex. There's a sizable collection of canons, the most famous of which is this. Now that's that's quite pretty, isn't it? That's Canon in B flat for six voices, written by Mozart in Vienna in 1782. The less formal title is Lech mich im Arch. Translated into English, that's kiss my ass. And that's about all I can quote from the piece without getting any emails about disgusting language. Now, this was probably written as a party piece to get some giggles out of friends. But after he died, Mozart's widow sought to have these and other similar works published. But since they were so gross, the lyrics were sanitized for almost 200 years. It wasn't really until 1991 that the original versions were widely made public. Mozart also wrote obscene letters for fun to his father, his mother, his wife, his sister, his cousin, and a bunch of friends. Why is this important to music history? A couple of reasons, actually. First, it shows Mozart's sense of humor and that of his friends. Second, it reinforces the thinking that scatological humor was way more mainstream back then, including in polite society, than it is today. And third, It offers insight into German culture and folklore at large in the 18th century. Oh, and fourth, it's part of a field of study called scatolinguistics, which is the study of dirty words and how they're used. See, it's kind of stupid, stupid history, but it's also fascinating. I think we need to play something here. And I guess there's really only one choice. This is from 1995. This is Falco. And there were no fewer than 21 versions of this recording available. Here's the original. Okay, enough of that. Let's let's try this. It is indisputable that Iggy Pop played an important part in the development and rise of punk music and everything that came after. First with the Stooges in the late 1960s and early 70s, then later as a solo artist. Any music historian will agree that Iggy Pop is the godfather of punk. Very important dude. Iggy, however, was also a voracious consumer of drugs. LSD, heroin, PCP, whatever. And when you think of Iggy's musical friends, Elton John isn't really somebody who comes to mind. Here is where stupid history comes in. In October 1973, Iggy and the Stooges were playing a show at Richard's Club, a venue in Atlanta. They were on a punishing tour, sometimes playing two shows a day. Elton John had just released his legendary double album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, and was approaching the peak of his early career. It was on a big arena and stadium tour of the U.S. At the time, Elton was in competition with his friend David Bowie over who could be the biggest British rock star. Bowie, you might know was also friends with Iggy and was working with the Stooges. Elton thought he'd have a little fun with Bowie and his relationship with the Stooges, and in the process, maybe he could sign them to his new record label. A writer and photographer from Cream Magazine, the music publication based out of the Stooges' hometown of Detroit, wanted to help Elton show some support for Iggy. So they got in contact with Elton's people to set up a surprise visit to boost the Stooges' morale. A few days before Elton played a show in Athens, Georgia, he made a trip to Richard's Club in Atlanta to check out the Stooges. Iggy, however, was blitzed out of his mind. He disappeared the previous night with a local woman and had gobbled up all her quaaludes. 
and Iggy was so out of it he had to be carried to the club. With the band about to go on, their lead singer was still incapacitated, and that's when guitarist James Williamson invoked the nuclear option. Through a friend of the band, Williamson found a quantity of meth and a syringe. He injected Iggy, which was enough to get him on his feet and on stage. He was still very incoherent, but at least he was semi-conscious. Meanwhile, in another area of the club, the writer and the photographer were helping Elton John into a rented gorilla suit. The idea was to surprise Iggy on stage and get some pictures for the magazine. Elton loved the idea because he, he kind of fancied James Williamson. So the Stooges start their set. And after a few songs, Elton John, dressed in a gorilla suit, bounds on stage. Iggy, in his altered state and seeing Triple, freaked out, thinking that this was a real gorilla. Either that or he was hallucinating like he'd never hallucinated before. Meanwhile, the rest of the Stooges, who were more or less straight, didn't appreciate this goof in a gorilla costume crashing their set. James Williamson was just about to take a swing at the ape when Elton pulled off the head of the costume, revealing his identity. Iggy calmed down for a while, danced with Elton on stage for a song or two before Elton departed. Alas, the mutual admiration didn't amount to anything after that. Iggy and the Stooges spiraled towards a breakup, Iggy got deeper into drugs, and Elton never did sign him or the band to a record contract. For the record, the Stooges were playing this song when the gorilla came on stage and Stupid History was made. Our next bit of Stupid History dates back to December 3rd, 1997 at Foro Sol Stadium in Mexico City. You too had just played a 25-song set and were coming off stage when one of the security guards said, you need to get into the car and get out of here now. Three sons of Mexican President Ernesto Zedillo had just showed up unannounced at the gig. They didn't have any tickets. They didn't have any passes. Just the sons and their group of Secret Service bodyguards. The local security guides at the venue weren't about to argue, so the Zedillo boys and their entourage just drove into the backstage area in a van. They then watched the show from the wings. Towards the end of the gig, they wanted to leave, so their Secret Service guy started roughly clearing a pass through the crowd and decided to take a shortcut through a backstage area that was off-limits to everyone but the people who were operating the camera cranes for a DVD shoot. Because there were all these counterweights swinging around, it really wasn't a safe place for anyone. One of the camera operators rushed over to tell them to get out, and that's when things got weird. U2's road crew jumped in to help. They had no idea who these people were. They were just doing their job. When the Mexican Secret Service dudes tried to get out, Jerry Mele, the head of U2's security detail, tried to block the van with his body. It was his job to detain the people in the van until the police arrived. Again, he had no idea who was in the van. But the van just ran over Jerry, resulting in some serious back injuries. Honestly, the, the dude has never been the same. Next thing you two know is they get a call from the president. Please don't go to the press about this. Instead, please come to the palace so we can discuss this. So the next day, everybody from the band found themselves in the president's office. The sons were there too, with all the albums they expected to be signed. Zadio said, look, let, let's forget about what happened. This could have been a lot worse. You took on our secret service. Best let it go. In other words, badges? We don't need no stinking badges. So what could you two do? Meanwhile, poor Jerry still, as far as I know, has a very bad back. Here's you two from that night in Mexico, recorded right about the time the Mexican Secret Service ran over their chief of security backstage. Back with more Stupid History, the music edition, in just a sec. And I want to prepare you right now that I have Eddie Vedder eating some vomit. This is a selection of stupid history from the world of rock. These are the stories that aren't talked about, but should be because they give a more accurate idea of how weird this business can be. When you're on tour, you're in a bubble for months at a time. It's tour bus, hotel, gig, repeat for months on end. 
and you will go a little batty. Now, let's go back to the days of the original touring edition of Lollapalooza, a bunch of young, passionate bands cooped up together on a caravan road trip across North America. The 1992 edition of the tour featured something called the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. This consisted of a bunch of freaky people with freaky talents. A favorite was Mr. Lifto. His thing was being able to hoist weights and things with um, his, uh, his, his, his little Mr. Lifto. But then there was also Matt the Tube Crowley. Now, Matt's deal was that he could eat anything and then regurgitate whatever he'd eaten on command. Part of his act involved swallowing a seven-foot hose, and at the other end was a hand pump. Matt would then pump all sorts of things directly into his stomach. Beer, ketchup, mustard, chocolate, pink Pepto-Bismol, syrup, anything that was available. And then he would pump it all back out again. It's gross, but just wait. He then poured this mess into a glass and then offered the cocktail of goo and bile and Matt's half-digested last meal to anyone willing to drink it. This, this was a big dare. On one stop on the tour, which featured both Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, Eddie Vedder and Chris Cornell decided they would have a drinking contest. And the drink was the stuff pumped out of Matt the Tube Crowley's stomach. And for the record, and for all time, Eddie won this contest. And I hope it was worth it. Let me just add something unusual about Eddie Vedder. He was a child model. Growing up in Chicago, Mum paraded Eddie through endless photo shoots and TV commercial auditions. If you know where to look, you can find pictures of Eddie modeling the latest in back-to-school wear for the stylish five-year-old. He appeared in at least five different department store catalogs. He also appeared in TV commercials for Hallmark greeting cards and Chuckles Candy. And if you're of a certain age, you may remember a commercial for Mattel's Big Wheel that ran during Saturday morning cartoons. And one of the kids on the Big Wheel was Eddie Vedder. Eddie's biggest triumph was probably his appearance on the nationally broadcast Bozo the Clown Show back in the early 1970s. Stupid history. Still with grunge, let's pivot to Kurt Cobain. Now, you're probably wondering what's left to know about Kurt, and I agree. So much has been written about this guy in Nirvana that we've learned everything that we possibly can. <laughs> well, maybe not. Let's try this stupid history. Kurt had an artistic aesthetic that included things like images of fetuses and human anatomy. This went back to grade school when many of his drawings for art class included images of fetuses and various bits of human anatomy. If you've ever looked carefully at the artwork for the In Utero album, you'll see all kinds of disassembled and reconstructed dolls and medical models, fetuses and embryo-like things. This was in addition to his curiosity about various types of human excreta, Remember, this is a man who named one of his first bands Fecal Matter. Kurt also created things like weird landscapes filled with images like um, diseased vaginas. There's just no other way to say it. These were photos that he found in an old medical textbook. If you read his journals, you know, the book of his writings published by Courtney Love in 2002, you'll find that Kurt seemed to have a real obsession with bodily functions and excreta. Vomit, urine, mucus, poop. Remember, this is a guy, again, who named one of his first bands Fecal Matter. Kurt also apparently had a thing for vintage medical equipment and surgical gear. And we're talking stuff beyond stethoscopes and blood pressure cuffs, things like old gynecological instruments. I have been told that at one point he had a full-sized medical dummy. One story says that not only did he keep it around the house, but he toured with it. It had its own trunk and everything. Very, very strange. Kurt also became enraptured with the story of a French perfume maker. His name was Jean-Baptiste Grenoy. His ultimate goal was to create a scent that smelled like virginity. Whatever. Uh, maybe you saw an adaptation of the story in a movie called Perfume, the story of a murderer. That came out in 2006. Anyway, Grenoy was 
born with an almost supernatural sense of smell and set out to create the ultimate perfume. And in the process, he ends up murdering 25 young women as he tries to steal their scent using some pretty awful methods, which involved either dissolving their bodies in acid or lye and extracting their fat. Again, there's the surgical thing. Anyway, this story appealed to Kurt Cobain in some weird way, and he even wrote a song about it for the In Utero album. It's called Scentless Apprentice. One of the worst slams that you can make against an artist is that they have sold out. Things are a little different now because artists need new streams of revenue just to make ends meet. Get an offer to license your music for a TV commercial or a soundtrack or something else? No problem. But let's go back to 1986 for a British band called Sig Sig Sputnik. And their whole thing, their whole image was built on being sellouts. The head guy was Tony James, who used to play in Generation X with Billy Idol. Mick Jones of The Clash helped out with their sound in the studio. When the group appeared in the press, they announced that their slogan was Fleece the World. The group was described as high-tech sex, designer violence, and the fifth generation of rock and roll. It was also their goal to raise selling out to a new level. Music was secondary to hype, packaging, image, costumes, hair, slogans, and making money. It was pretty in-your-face and shocking for 1986. Oh, and did I mention that several members of the band had almost zero musical ability? They looked good, though, which was the only reason they were there. Sig Sig Sputnik didn't even bother putting together a demo tape to get their record deal. All they did was show a bunch of executives a video consisting of a bunch of clips from a bunch of science fiction movies. Their inspirations were listed as the characters from A Clockwork Orange, Terminator, and Mad Max. Again, this is 1986 and things were very different. The resulting feeding frenzy was substantial, and the advance from EMI Records was very significant. Before the album came out, they auctioned off advertising space between the tracks of their 1986 debut album entitled Flaunt It and Company's Bit. Not only did Studio Line from L'Oreal and id magazine by space on the external album artwork but commercials were embedded in the album itself let me show you once considered the most pretentious magazine in the history of the world now simply the best id magazine the indispensable document of fashion style and ideas month by month a cliche crusher for the 21st century id magazine fully designed for a better future id is tomorrow calling are you brave enough to answer 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 Despite all the hype, however, the album didn't do so well, and Sig Sig Sputnik broke up after their second album. People thought that the band was nothing but crass commercialism, which was the point. That's exactly what they were. Still, Sig Sig Sputnik managed to get their debut single into the top 10 in several countries around the world, and it was called Love Missile F-111. The crazy Sig Sig Sputnik and their sellout career strategy. It worked to an extent. The band survived in fits and starts over 20 years, finally ending it all in 2004. A couple more stupid history stories yet to come, including one that involves 3,000 dead pigeons. Don't go anywhere. Back in the day, the Happy Mondays were a real piece of work. In fact, I could probably do an entire Stupid History episode on them alone. So many drugs, so much alcohol, so many stupid escapades. Let me give you a couple of examples. Singer Sean Ryder used to be a postman, a job that he found very boring. And one day on his rounds, he decided to drop a tab of acid just to make things more interesting. At some point, he had to drop the mail off at a pub, and that's where he ran into a dog. It was a terrier, a rather territorial one at that, and the dog went after him. I mean, after all, he was a postman. But Sean would have none of this. He picked up the dog and bit it. 
Another postman going by saw this, reported him, and he was suspended. So postman bites dog. Sean was also so wasted one day that he overslept and found that his bandmates and the roadies had already left for that night's gig. He took off for the venue, rushed through the stage door, and ran on stage just as the band was starting to perform its first song. Unfortunately, he went into the wrong place. He accidentally invaded the stage of Simply Red. The Mondays were playing a few doors down. So much crack and so much heroin was consumed while the Mondays were recording their fourth album in Barbados that they wrecked a fleet of rental cars. Bez from the band broke his arm on this trip three times. And the couch from the control room at the studio disappeared because Sean and Bez traded it for drugs. It said that Sean spent up to 20 hours in the bathroom smoking crack during those sessions. But then there was a situation with the pigeons. Sean grew up in Manchester where there were lots of pigeons and Sean did not like the birds. Details are a bit sketchy, but one day after too many birds tried to nick his Kentucky Fried Chicken as he was eating outside, Sean decided to take his revenge. There are conflicting stories about what actually happened. One says that he dipped hunks of bread in rat poison and fed that to the pigeons. Another said he actually gave them tiny rocks of crack. Variations of the story have him using meth and ecstasy as well. Anyway, by the time he was done, Sean says that about 3,000 pigeons fell from the sky over Manchester. When he was asked why he did it, he says, because I was a horrible kid. I never do something like that now. Do what you do. Here is one more stupid history story. How much of a knob do you have to be so that your bodyguard, the guy hired to protect you, has had enough and then proceeds to beat the hell out of you? This is exactly what happened with Sid Vicious during the Sex Pistols one and only tour of America. Manager Malcolm McLaren had this insane idea. Instead of playing all the big markets across the U.S., the group would duck down into the Deep South and play out-of-the-way markets that were decidedly not punk-friendly. The more redneck, the better. I, I, I know, I, I don't get the logic either. No one did. And of course, the tour went about as well as you'd expect. At the Longhorn Ballroom in Dallas on January 10th, 1978, Sid was headbutted in the nose by a groupie named Helen Killer Keller, who had driven all the way from Los Angeles just to do that. The band was pelted with cans and bottles, and not just cans and bottles, because the crowd came prepared with rotten tomatoes, and get this, pig snouts. Don't know where you get those, but this was Texas. At a truck stop somewhere on the way to California, Sid was confronted by some rednecks who questioned if this skinny punk from Britain was actually all that tough. Uh, l- let me just have Malcolm McLaren tell you the story. I'll never forget the day in in America. I think it was um, somewhere near San Antone on the last ill-fated tour they had that um, Sid at that time, of course, got involved in the world of drugs, uh, naturally inclined to develop a taste for groupies and and one that ultimately ultimately met a peril. But... um, uh, he, uh, th- at that time, was very out to lunch and would only uh, eat Knickerbocker glories and usually three at the, at the, in one go and they would be mounted on the table and um, that day in a little m- motel-type restaurant that we pulled into, uh, he apparently... Um, I was sitting near a table where a mother and daughter and father and son were eating their steak and chips and uh, they didn't like the smell that was coming across the table. And we, of course, never sat with him anyway. We were quite used to the idea. But uh, he was wearing his typical uh, chain round his neck and uh, this dirty black T-shirt that he hadn't taken off for six months and it had this big swastika on it and his leather jacket and his feet were black but um, hidden by by the boots that he wore and uh, 
um, noises began to uh, appear from the table of this family and saying rather rude things about our dear Sid. And uh, Sid, not one to um, stand by, um, decided to get up from the table and did a thing. You might all reel in horror now. He went round to the back of the gentleman that was eating his steak and chips and pulled his sleeve back and threw his arm over and above the man's head and over the, the man's plate up fairly high and withdrew a penknife from his pocket and slashed his arm and all the blood blew out like ketchup over the man's steak. Well, you can imagine that place. This was full of very rednecky guys, long-distance truck drivers. I thought we were going to die. And then there was the bodyguard confrontation. Sid had a minder named Glenn Allison, a 6'5", 250-pound Vietnam vet. Sid challenged him to a fight. Allison began by grabbing Sid by the throat and smacked his head up against the ceiling. And when Allison finished pummeling Sid's head against a sink half a dozen times, Sid said through bloody teeth, You're good enough. I like you. Now we can be friends. Oh, a side note. When the Texas Ballroom hosted the Sex Pistols, it was run by a guy named Dewey Groom. Fifteen years earlier, the place was known as the Carousel Club. Groom worked for Jack Ruby, the owner of the club. He's the guy who assassinated Lee Harvey Oswald. How's that for a historical connection? And thus concludes this lesson in Stupid History, the music version. And this is just the beginning. I bet we could do another 20 shows on this topic, and we might just have to. Again, learning dates and events and biographies of influential people is important, but it's the stupid stuff that can really make history come alive. Don't you think? If you want more ongoing history, there's plenty. This is episode 1025, which means there are hundreds of podcasts available for free. Just download and go. There's my other podcast too, Uncharted, Crime and Mayhem in the Music Industry, which looks at the intersection of rock and true crime. If that's your thing, I highly recommend checking it out. We can meet up on all those social media platforms. There's my website, ajournalofmusicalthings.com, which is updated every single day. And best get the daily newsletter, so you're always up to date on all things music. Email should go to alan at alancross.ca, and I guarantee a response. Technical production for all this is by Rob Johnston. I'll talk to you next time.